Felicitations! Hello everybody, it is me Felicia Day and I am so excited to be here with a live version of my podcast. For the month of July, Twitch is featuring podcasts and interview shows. I am very fortunate to know a lot of very interesting people and I thought that I would invite some of my favorites on to chat because I haven't been in my house in a year. So I'm actually seeing a lot of them for the first time and even talking to them the first time because I'm a bad friend. Anyway, tonight we have some <laughs> supernatural specials. Um, so if you're a fan of the show, you will see some familiar faces. Um, and I, at eight o'clock, we will have Kim Rhodes on. But currently, we have the amazing Jim Beaver and Sam Smith. Hello. <laughs> Greetings. I'm so happy to see both of you. Sam, I was I, I drew that I drew that out because you stood up and your crotch was like right there. So oh I my was God. like, I'm I don't so want to go. My my sprinklers came on right outside the window. I'm trying to shut the window. Oh my God. <laughs> Are you being drenched right now? What's going on? No, it's just been it's so loud. It's literally the the, the sprinkler system is right outside this window. And it will like kunk, kunk, We're not hearing it. You look amazing. Your hair has grown seven feet. Uh I'm Jim is your mermaid. You are full mermaid. What about you, Jim? Are you a mermaid? Uh, no, I couldn't pass the physical. <laughs> wow, there's a physical requirement for being transformed into a merman made man. <laughs> there, there, the the mermaid the criteria is much lower. Yeah, the bar is pretty low. Yeah, for the maid part versus the man. Right. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, gotta well, do a little arm arm day. Did you know? Do you notice I've been working out for three weeks, y'all? Look at this. Look at you, Gun Central. I know. Look at that. Look. There's what a, have you been doing? What is the workout? Okay, I'm an, I'm gonna be a bougie a hole and say that I do have a I have a trainer for ten weeks. Okay. Great. I don't know. Have you ever had a trainer like for a job, either of you? Yes. Not, not really. I, they they just take a look at me and think there's nothing we can do here. <laughs> that is not true. Not true, Jim. That's not true. <laughs> I have to tell you, of all the people in Supernatural, these are the most two adored people. They are gems <laughs> in front of the camera, behind the camera, so good at what they do, but also just people, when you're around them, you feel like you're glowing. And even though J Aww. Jim plays a crotchety, self-deprecating person, he is truly a gem of a gentleman if i were going to be an apocalypse i definitely would want to be in your hands jim it's well true. um careful what you wish for i was an apocalypse with jim and it was great yeah until he kicked us out of the camp it was oh no it was the, it was the best apocalypse i was ever in you guys had so many I didn't, okay i was gonna say we're not going to talk about the show oh so audience if you have any questions or comments for sam or jim please leave them in there uh leave them in chat my wonderful mods are going to be picking up some key juicy questions for me to ask toward the end of the hour but for now we're just going to be gabbing but i, I didn't want to talk about the show but i do want to say that that last season the last two seasons you guys had stellar well i mean sam unfortunately spoiler <laughs> alert <laughs> <laughs> I, w <laughs> I do want to talk about one thing that's more general. Okay, we've all worked a lot. Wait, wait, Sam, first, you didn't say your trainer. You didn't tell your trainer story. What, oh, what it, was for, it was for Supernatural. When I came back in season 12, they had to teach me to fight. So they sent a Krav Maga trainer to my house. What? It was so, it, I was so bad at it. They kind of... <laughs> They were like, we're gonna teach you this one move because I had to throw Jensen. And then on the day we get there and it's raining and we're in the wet grass. And they're like, do this instead. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I can't like change tracks. I know one dance move. So, yeah. I mean, you tried, right? You, I mean, how long was it? Cause you can't learn Krav Maga in like one day. Like you No, it was how many like, sessions did it you It was get? over the course of like two weeks. And then I did some boxing and stuff. and. They taught me just enough that I could fake the initial moves that the stunt girl could take over for me. Okay. But over the course of the three years, I got much, much better. I started doing boxing and all that. And then ultimately I realized that I really felt too old for that. <laughs> I just stopped. <laughs> I mean, just doing like 
just doing any kind of trying to like the plank movement is very upsetting for me because I think I'm heavier on top than I used to be. And my arms are getting thinner. I don't know about you. Jim. What do you do plank for a is workout? Hard. Yeah. Plank is one of the hardest things you can do. Yeah. What do you, what do you do for a workout, Jim? I change channels. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to mess with this. <laughs> You're actually looking pretty fit there, Jim. Yeah. Well, why. Um, it's, um, it's, it's the, uh, stress and anxiety diet. It works pretty well. And, uh, I recommend a pandemic to anybody who's fighting weight. Yeah. So. I mean, certainly the eating in uh, a little bit and also, yeah, the extreme stress and, uh, what, what have you, so let's talk about COVID and the last year, because now we're kind of a little bit opening up. We're having a little bit more of a, I can go tiptoe out. Although when somebody goes for a hug, I'm like, no, you get back. Mm. <laughs> it's funny, right? Yeah. I went, I actually went to a Pilates class today in person. <gasps> my first one. With other people sweat in the air? Like eight <laughs> other people were in the room. Human dander floating everywhere, Sam? The only person with a mask on was one student and the teacher. How but I'm like, feel? that's what a vaccine is for. I know, you're right, you're right. And we were right. every other bed. Yeah. We'll see, I'll talk to you in about seven days. I mean, I think <laughs> it's gonna be fine, right? Like if you are immunized, then the, the, the variants, you're protected against them. That's exactly why I mean, amazing scientists came up with it. Pretty much, right? Like, I, I just, I feel like, I have my vaccine and, and I wasn't like licking anyone else's Pilates bench. So <laughs> <laughs> don't knock it till you've tried it. <laughs> it is weird though. I've been to a couple restaurants and it's weird being out around people. It's strange. Yeah, do you, I mean, do you remember the first food? one? Yeah. Jim, do you remember the first time after since the COVID has uh, lessened that you went out into doing well, like a public friend thing i was i was going out a lot before it uh i mean i went to i went to canada to work three times before <gasps> any of it loosened up what show were you on the boys or what what are you boys. working on yeah well mm -hmm. i was shooting i i did a couple of episodes of the boys and then i did uh guillermo del toro's new movie nightmare alley and uh what I had to go. I had to go to Toronto three different times, and I quarantined for fourteen days each time. Um, wow! I was nervous, but um, at the same time, I was working, so uh, that was you know, it was a good thing. But right. yeah, I've been out and about a lot. I got my I got my vaccination wrapped up in February, and oh. so I've been pretty. Uh, uh, I've been pretty free. I'm still very careful. I'm a lot more careful than some people in my situation might be, but um, I, I just know that it's, it's so important to be vaccinated and to be around vaccinated people. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't, I know just enough science to know that nothing is absolute. So a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Right. I still wear a mask when I'm in um, most public situations, and uh, and then I and I I, uh, I stay at home as much as I possibly can because uh, people want me to. I mean, people, well, no, nobody wants you to. Clearly, you're a popular uh, actor. I mean, the Guillermo del Toro movie and the Boy. I mean, the Boys is an amazing show, and Isn't it? it really is. It's like because you, you you take a subject. And you're like, oh, gosh, superheroes. Like, I'm so over yeah. them. And WandaVision yeah. was the only thing besides the boys. Looks like, oh, wow, I'm thinking about this in a different way. It's so wonderful. But, yeah. um, yeah. And they got nominated for an Emmy today for Best Drama Series. Incredible. It's yeah. really incredible. Well, you know, um, maybe I just got new headshots done, so maybe I'll be an extra sometime. <laughs> hey. Huh? Well, it's Eric, it's Eric Kripke, so, uh, you know, he's... Uh, he seems very fond of uh, most of us from Supernatural. I know, so, but but I'm not the kind of actor that's going to be like, "Hey, just keep me in mind." You know, I'm never, I've never like email re outreached anybody like, "Hi, friend." You know, because I just, I, I have this. Are Are you that kind of actor? Because I know that's no, okay. Because no. I can't, I can't do it. I know some people are just like, 
hi, I'm available. I like Mark Shepard told me like he's got three jobs because he does that. He just follows up with people. I'm like, I don't know how to do oh, it. You know what? Yeah. I did. I have done that a couple of times. One time was with Eric Kripke when he did that show Revolution. I read the pilot and I wanted, I read this part and I was like, I could knock this out. And he made a call and let me come in. But the reason I, they didn't call me in the first place apparently was because it was um, the part of the mom that dies mysteriously. <laughs> <laughs> <on the pilot>. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like well nah. <laughs> so that was i was like well all right i get it um but you got called so, in right no and i got to go and see the people and it was great um for you know oh and and they also got elizabeth um what's her name uh She's Shoe. amazing. What? Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shue? No, no. Um, mm. I can't remember. Somebody will know. Somebody, Somebody in, in chat, somebody. tell us who actually got this, got this, got this role. Somebody's got it on their Rolodex. You're um, going to know who she was. She's, she's amazing. And she's a, a star. So she's a star. She's a, Elizabeth Mitchell. Yeah. Victor says, I don't even yes. know who that is. Oh, really? You, you would, if you saw her. She's okay. worked a lot and she's great. Yeah, well, um, but yeah, it's, you, but that's okay. But it's hard to put yourself out there like that. You're like, can you please? And they're like, mm. yeah. Well, but but you kind of think, you know, that's the thing about it because, like, whenever in my past I have had I have castings, and you just can't. Sometimes there's a person who sticks in your mind. You're like, I have to make something for them. But then sometimes you're just like, oh, hey, because there's just so many. You know, you have eight million things on your mind I, as the super showrunner producer i am but you know you do you, you're just no, overwhelmed a reminder is never bad if it's if it's somebody you'd want to you know i just okay. don't have that i i'm really i'm too like awkward to do it now most it's of like, the time hey god hey what's up so jim how was shooting during covid like that must not have been as it, fun as usual possibly it was it was uh yeah it was it was tougher um mm -hmm. i'm i'm one of those weird people that doesn't mind being locked in a hotel room for 14 days so i didn't mind the i didn't mind the quarantine yeah at all but shooting was um it was odd especially because one of the jobs was the very last day of supernatural oh. and uh uh and uh i hadn't seen the guys in six months and uh, I get there and the first impulse is to run around and hug everybody. And yeah. everybody's, you know, at arm's length or more. And uh, it, w it was very weird. Um, uh, I, I, I confess that we all stayed apart from each other and you know, all the crew wore masks and everything. And then we, uh, we were all gathered for the very last shot of the show. And when it was over, everybody just started hugging one another like it wasn't Aww. COVID at all because we couldn't resist it. But um, for the most part, it was um, uh, it, it was odd. It wasn't awful, but it was odd. Um, yeah. On the Del Toro film, I have a, I have a really big mustache uh, and I couldn't wear a mask between takes uh because of the size of this mustache they had on me and so i had to wear a, a plastic face shield that hung on my neck and uh <laughs> sounds awful it, well that was awful because it was really really cold and it kept fogging up and so i kept tripping over things because i couldn't see and um and then you know i had to take it off for every take and put it back on and but um you know, this is this is major first world problems. Uh, oh, of course, of course. You know, uh, it's, At least you uh, didn't have to try to do like some, because I heard a friend of mine had to do like a kissing scene, like when it first was yeah. broken and they were trapped. First of all, they were trapped in Canada away from their family. And then uh, they had to be tested like twice a day up until yeah. the kissing scene. And then they put like film on their mouths so they wouldn't actually touch lips wow. which i'm like that seems kind of strange that's oh how God. i normally do it oh okay that's how you normally do it <laughs> we'll have to have a conversation about that um <laughs> you know apparently on the soap operas they were doing like 
the kissing and stuff, they'd have the spouse of the actor or actress come in and have a wig and like they'd be doing it that way. From oh, the back, wow. From the switch. Well, well um, that was one of the things that Jen said last week. Jen Padalecki was on and she was like, yeah, you know, it, it helps in COVID to be the wife of the star. <laughs> I mean, yeah. she, she's an incredible actress. So she definitely earned that part. But uh, yeah, I guess in the midst of COVID, you don't want to really kiss anybody, but somebody you're already going to kiss anyway, right? Exactly. I shot something in February, also in Toronto. I I saw you travel. Yes. Yes. And it was, you know, the shield and the thing on the plane and like, and the two week quarantine, you know, you, you get off the plane in Canada and you have to have your COVID test in hand. And, um, they, they run you like, like at Disneyland through the ropes, six feet apart. And then you get a COVID test when you land Mm -hmm. in the airport. And then they bring you, I missed by just a few days, the new thing where they make you stay at a hotel at the airport for three days. Is that and then still you can now? Go to your other hotel for the remaining 11 days. That's so still I, now though? Is the 14 day quarantine still on? Yes. And so oh. the 14 days in quarantine, I was okay until about day 10. And then I started to get like, <laughs> um, like I'd like put my head out in the hall and just look around. When I arrived at the, I was at a, like a residence, like the, like a apartment residence. And um, I remember like checking in and looking back over my shoulder at the door and being like, well, I like having an impulse to make a run for it. <laughs> I was going into like two weeks of jail. Um, yeah. But, and I didn't really know many people on the set, just a couple. Um, and it was. What were you shooting? Can you say? What, what um, were you shooting? I can I can do this. Okay. And I wait, may or may what? not have had stuff on my face, so I wait, also had what? The shield. And it, I felt like a dog who had had like an operation because you have this shield around your face, and you, <laughs> I know <laughs> you're blowing my mind. Still, I'm so excited for you. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm so that's like my dream to have stuff on the face and oh oh like fittings and the whole like stuff and wow everybody in chat is going crazy right now (laughs) i may be in trouble but (laughs) it's okay she didn't say anything y'all she didn't say anything i didn't no um so i couldn't do that show because i can't do the thing you know that was that was the requirement right it was to do that you kind of have to be able to do that right right I could do it both. Did, you know, not, I had to practice. Okay, no, this is funny. Mark I only do this? was this also Mark and Mindy Nanu Nanu. Was that this? Nanu Nanu he... Nanu. It, did he do the same thing as Spock, or was it different? I can't remember. I don't know. I'm not. I I, I remember that show only vaguely. I'm so. I you I might just but, be a little bit younger, enough yeah. younger. Like I, I watched that show religiously. I don't do shows where I have to do that. <laughs> you know, the only reason I know how to do it on this side uh, for real is photo ops because you know my character Charlie went peace out bitches and so that's kind of like everybody asked me can you do the the sign but in photo ops some people are like I only want to be on this side so if I want to take a picture with somebody at the convention I have to do I had to learn how and like physically for a long time I had to just <laughs> really you had to train yourself I had to train myself to do it on the left side is that one of those things like a tongue roll like some people can do it and some people can't it's genetic. Can you do? No. You Wait. can't do it? Ooh. Oh, yeah, but you I can't can. do the one like the four leaf clover. You know, people could go like, uh, and, that's, fold that's, it back. I don't trust those people. I can do the roll, but not the other one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, I have not worked during COVID except in front of this camera because I'm addicted to streaming now. But um, I, I have to say, t- uh, talking to my friends, it's been especially hard. I know that you have a kiddo, Sam. And yes. Jim, you have a kiddo. How, mm-hmm. like, it's extra hard to be quarantining because that means two weeks, two weeks more away from your kid. So yes. how well, did you My kid's in that? school in New York, so. Oh, okay. We're, so you were. We're apart anyway. You're apart anyway. So you have, a, you have an older kid, but Sam's kid right. is not so old. Mine just turned 13. <gasps> Are you kidding? We met when he was nine. Yes. Oh, life. I have her Brio. She gave me her Brio, and then I gave him a bunch of Magic the Gathering cards. Did he ever get into that? No, but we have them. Okay. We have them. Okay. 
Well, one day I feel like them. I'm going to be the one who has a few. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, we sort of have always had a rule. We try not to go more than two weeks and never more than three. Yeah. Um, apart unless, you know, and I never have. And so this ended up being almost three weeks to the day. It was two weeks of quarantine, and then a week of fittings and, and filming. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but you know, two weeks of it sitting in the hotel room, you really, you lose track of time. Like time, yeah. it's, it's, it's very strange. Um, but uh, yeah, it definitely, it, it, it is a consideration because no matter what you're doing, you have a two extra week dead yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. I think it has changed. I'm going back next week and uh, uh, to Toronto and I only have to, I think I have to stay in a hotel room for like three days. Oh, oh. okay, great. Yeah. yeah, But yeah, that's only for vaccinated people. I don't even know if they're letting unvaccinated. In. Yes, 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 yes. I think that's true. They just changed it. If you're vaccinated, it's a much shorter period of time, which makes sense. That makes I mean, sense. And I guess yeah. Canadian vaccination rates are increasing. So, yes. I mean, it's all going to be fine pretty soon. But, you know, I don't know. It's, can, it's crazy. They would they COVID test you three times a week when you're up there right now, like everyone on the show. So, I mean, the expense wow. and the time and yeah. and the PPE costs, and I forgot to put my shield on a couple of times and got like in big trouble. So, I mean, it's a, um, it's a big they, deal, but they're smart, you know, like you, they're being extra careful. Now, can your kiddo be vaccinated? What is the cutoff age for vaccinations? 12. 12. So he, yes, he, yes, he's, he's, he has, he has been. That's amazing. See, I have a four-year-old, so I, you know, for me, like even going to conventions and stuff, I'm a little wary. They say that the totally. person, the person who's vaccinated can't, they say that the person who's vaccinated can't necessarily carry they, uh, it back, but of do course- Do they know? Do they know? Yeah, They're do like, we hundred percent know? Like, well, you can, because you can yeah. get it. So if you can mm -hmm. get it, you can carry it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So you could be a passive carrier or a, uh, un well, I don't forget what the, they say so, yeah so it's it's especially hard for me yeah yeah asymptomatic exactly um during covid did you guys i this is one of my favorite questions because i picked up a couple hobbies like gardening and baking and that's why i have a trainer because i really picked up baking <laughs> <laughs> did you guys discover anything i mean you might jim you might have been too busy but is there anything you discovered or rediscovered about yourself or you know like a hobby or something you picked up that uh that you can kind not, of thank covid for not really not really a hobby i i mean my favorite pastime is watching old movies and boy i cranked that up <laughs> um, my my first my 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 quarantine in toronto in um uh, february I, I in 14 days i saw 41 movies mm -hmm. um jeez i binged that, some shows for sure you you just what else are you gonna do in there yeah but i not so much new stuff but i i've been i've been working on this book for years and years and years and always complaining i didn't have time to work on it and suddenly i had a lot of time to work on it so yeah. um i didn't do as much as i should have, but I have been, I, I, I really increased my writing time, but nothing new, not really. I mean, that's a big deal though, because I definitely, after taking about six months to just do streaming and kind of unplugging from the Hollywood machine, I, I, you know, trying to do a lot of, especially like the producing and the writing and the Hollywood stuff. I'm like, it's not for me. And so for about six months, I did a lot of streaming, which was so fun and kind of like rediscovering my online and the community building and made me feel not lonely. But I started writing a lot more of my own stuff. And so, I don't know, it feels like it was creatively stifling for a while, but then creatively gave you room. I don't know, how did you, like Sam, you're a very creative person. You do lots of crafts, especially. I saw that you were like really revving up the crafts over holidays, or not holidays, I but was. COVID. I, I sort of, I don't think I started much new stuff, but I delved deeper into mm -hmm. cooking, into not so much baking. We baked a bunch of cakes in the beginning. And then I was like, I, I, we're just so sick of food at this point. Yeah. We're like, like, uh, just cooking and, sh and uh, grocery delivery is my new favorite thing in the world. 
Um, <laughs> it's true. Although they never pick good bananas. You cannot trust another human being to pick your own pick bananas for you. Yeah. That's mine. It's like yeah. someone picking your flowers. It's tricky. Yeah, it's not um, right. I did a lot, a lot of sewing. Mm -hmm. um, my dad, uh, right before COVID happened, he happened to be out here on a on a boat, on a ship, on a trip, and had brought my grandmother's antique Singer sewing machine with him because it weighs three million pounds because it's iron. Um, it's from 1931 or two. And I've been using that to sew when it's better than any sewing machine I've ever had. Oh, wow. So I, I took it all apart and I cleaned it and rebuilt it and then have been using that. Well, your husband's really, you guys are just crafty people because he- I, He's super Sam, handy. Oh. Sam's husband makes the most beautiful spoons. And I know that's really strange to say, but he makes wooden spoons that are so gorgeous. And I would really use them does. pretty much every day. And I never- Do you? Yes. Yeah. Jim, did you ever get yours? I hope you did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Absolutely. I mean, Jim um, looks like a daily cooker. You you look like you make your own marinara. You look. I can see you stirring some sauce, Jim. I um, I I have a routine with my cooking. I I go out to the freezer and I get one of these plastic bowls with beans and meat in it, and I microwave it for three minutes, just oh, three. God. And then you pull the plastic film off and, and eat it. And uh, I, I put my work up against any chef in the world. Jim, <laughs> you make me want to go over and take over your life for a couple of days. <laughs> no, I got a wife who cooks and she does a very, very good job of it. Okay, so, so you're not just like stranded and doing, yeah, okay, no. I got you. Okay. Nobody's dependent on me for eating. Good, good. I Listen, mean, we all have our strengths. Yeah, yeah. what are your strengths, Jim? My strengths are, I sleep really well, um, <laughs> and uh, and Zoom meetings. <laughs> Sleeping that well is actually not one of my strengths. It took me it's... twenty minutes to figure out how to get on here. Today. That was not your fault. We were we were marveling. Poor Sam was struggling with Zoom, and Zoom was not her friend. But she got on here, and she's on a phone, and you look beautiful. Thank you. By the way, you look amazing. Thank you. Um, can we talk about? Okay, so. We, can we talk about like just traveling now? Because I'm a little bit anxious. I think all of us have some conventions that we're going to appear at. And yes. first of all, for the first, it's been since like 2008, I have been doing many conventions a year. It's a, it's a wonderful way to support me, but also just like be out there amongst the community and see the world. It's wonderful. It was nice to take some time off, but then I got excited. And I was like, yes. And now I'm getting anxious again. Like, how do you guys... How are we going to approach commit? Like, how do we approach it? Are we going to be, I, I'm a little anxious. I'm like starting to fidget well, now. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I've already done three or four in the last few months. What? Yeah. Uh, in Texas, I think it was in Alabama. Um, wow. And how do they handle them? There was, everyone had to wear masks indoors. It was, I was already vaccinated or I think the first one I was mid, mid vaccine, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and people were just respectful and like photo ops, they would do like a plexiglass vertically, like perpendicular to the camera. So you could be right next to the person, but there's plexiglass. So you can take off your really? mask. Wow. And, um, there was no hugging and, or anything like that, but there were two tables and it was great. Everyone was really respectful. Um, airline travel is really, really controlled. And by the way, the plane is like, the cleanest, safest thing. Like I, I, I've always been the crazy person with the wipes. I wipe the tray table and the seat mm -hmm. belt and the back of the headrest and the TV, which so now it's a little blurry when I watch it, but I wipe <laughs> everything down. Um, and they do the fogging, but I still like, there's, it's still dirty. I'm just like, yeah, clean yeah, it yeah. all. Yeah. Um, and the way, and I turn the air thing and just have it point like over the top of my head just to push the air back. But the, the airline, the air on the plane is super clean. So you're, okay. so you're good. Um, okay. I'm more worried about the grungy airport. So I just keep my distance from people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I hear it's a little bit crazy. Well, it was crazier like early, like a month ago. And now it's gotten a little bit better. Cause I think there's a lot of, they weren't anticipating so many people just wanted to get out of their houses, which I don't know why they didn't yeah. do that. But we just, we just traveled to New York and the, air, the plane was packed. There was like one car left at the car rental. Um, 
there's, there's people over the beaches. It's crazy. Yeah, the beaches are crazy. You I have just, no impulse to vacation, but I would like to get out and just do, yeah, it's kind of like a vacation. It's work good. Kind of it's yes. good to be around people. I think as long as you're yeah. careful, you just have to maintain your, your boundaries. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you one thing, Sam? Uh, and I want this to dovetail into a question I have for both of you, because you have, all of us have worked a lot as actors and we have long and story careers. What is that movie poster on the back of behind you? Sam? Oh, <laughs> it's hiding behind my upright Pilates machine. That is what? a movie here. Shall I go like this? Yeah. Oh, is that you? Yeah. Ah! Can you see? Wait, yes, you have a nice reflection on your face, but I do see you. It's um, it was my I think it was my second job. Um, so my so it's called The Truth About Juliet. And it was a little independent feature um, directed and written by a guy named Sean McGinley. And my friend Spencer Garrett was in it. And Carl Wiedergott, who um, he auditioned to do backup voices for The Simpsons while we were doing that movie. And he ended up taking over and like he was living in this little tiny basement apartment. And now he, he's done like a thousand voices and has been on it ever since what so that was in like 96 or 97 it was my and you my, saw him kind of get that job, job. wow right. that's amazing the and funniest thing was my thank you i was a baby my audition um i brought in my resume and handed it to them and it had two things on it um an hbo commercial and seinfeld and they were like I what? remember seeing, I saw you on Seinfeld. Remember when I was like, oh my God, Sam, I just saw you on Seinfeld. And I've never fanned out more in my life because that's probably <laughs> my favorite TV show. And, and there is no more joy. If I am in the deepest depression, I put on a Seinfeld episode because nothing can make me laugh more than seeing Seinfeld. So seeing you on that show, I was like, how did, that was your first job? It was my first job. Like, first of all, I spent the whole week thinking they were going to fire me. I have no, to this day, I have no idea why they hired me. I had no idea what I was doing. Jason Alexander's like, no one can hear you. But the funny, the reason I brought it up is because when I handed my resume to, to the director, they all thought I was making it up, but they're like, That's, you don't make that up. No, I was like, no, it's very checkable. Like, <laughs> so yeah, so, so then there was that. Wow. I, I yeah, mean, you were really crazy. good on it. There was no, I mean, you were good Thank on you. it. Thank you. But there's nothing worse. I remember acutely just not being prepared for anything in Hollywood. Jim, can you remember one of your first jobs? Because it is just, you look back and you're like, wow, I did not know any, I should not have been on a movie set. You need to, I should no. have PA'd for like two years before going on a movie set as an actor. Oh God, Felicia, every what? day they deliver you the pink and yellow pages. Yeah. I didn't know what they were for. So I just put them <laughs> in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Everyone was reading the changed script on the new pages. And I was like, I don't have that. Mine's different. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my God, so good. Well, I, I, remember, I remember when we were shooting Birth of a Nation. <laughs> oh, um, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't remember very much about not knowing see i was i was kind of lucky in a weird way i started out doing extra work and uh my first few times on a movie set i was just background and uh uh and so i got to watch the actual actors do all their stuff and i was on a uh, on a uh, in particular, I was on a, a big movie with Burt Reynolds and uh, I was on it for um, a few weeks. And so I watched really carefully everything that was happening. So by the time I got into something where they'd actually let me talk, I had a pretty strong sense of, of how things worked. Um, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still weird uh, the first day that you're shooting and, and you don't know about marks and, uh, and the camera guys are going, could you please be in focus? Um, yep, I remember I've, I've been there, done that. I mean, I was, I was an extra on Pearl Harbor, 
uh -huh. Michael Bay's movie. And I was so angry because in my mind, I was going to have this amazing close up. Like it was this uh -huh. huge scene where there was all these caskets in the hangar. It was like an airplane hangar. And there were caskets everywhere. And like American flags went everywhere. It was a very solemn scene. And I was maybe 20 years old. It was like one of the first things, 20, 21 years old. And they gave me like an eight year old kid. And I went up to the, I was like, I'm sorry, but I'm not old enough to have this child. And they looked at me like I was an idiot because all they saw was my back in like from the biggest, widest. Uh, <laughs> crane shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> crane shot. It was like yeah. so far, I didn't understand. I had, I have done like a couple of short films before I moved, but like I was not educated and I certainly wasn't smart enough to do what you did, Jim. Uh, so I did do extra work, but it was so, you know, boring and I didn't really, I was never close mm -hmm. enough to understand what was any, anything that was going on. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very strange world and do what Jim did, y'all. If you want to be an actor, <laughs> an extra, learn how to hit so a mark. So smart. Yeah. Well, and then you'll know not to throw away your new new pages. That is incredible. Yeah. That's a good story. <laughs> we have some questions, okay? Um, oh, before we, yeah. So, uh, can you tell everybody what conventions you're going to be up at um, at before we end? Uh, just because I want to, I want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys Jim? are going to be anywhere, Jim, where are you going to be anywhere um, that people can meet you in person? I'm going to Lexington, Kentucky. Mm. Uh, in august i right. believe i've lost track of which is when mm -hmm. um and i'm zooming on my phone so i can't look at my calendar but okay. um i'm doing i think i'm doing um lexington and um uh, either nashville or pittsburgh i forget which <laughs> they're same pretty close yeah. to and each other <laughs> and then september I, in september i've got birmingham england Ooh. <gasps> what oh. yeah that's pretty. Is it the supernatural convention or is it just a general? Because uh, I went to the Star general. Star or something? Mm -hmm. Is it? I is think it's it... supernatural. Oh, okay. Because there's a I, uh, MCM Birmingham is a lovely event. I just I did that one a couple uh, years ago. Although the I, food. I don't want to. I don't want to say for certain that it is because I, I simply say yes to these things and then go where the car and the airplane take me. Yeah. Um, exactly. All right, so, so it, oh, people, okay, people in chat know your schedule better than you do, Jim. Pittsburgh. Good. Okay? Good. So, Pittsburgh. Y'all, um, I'm sorry about the ads. That is something that supports the show. If you want to subscribe to the channel, you don't get ads. And thank you for being here. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Sa so, Sam, you're, okay, so you're going to be in Lexington and Pittsburgh and Birmingham, England. They have the most famous um, Indian curry. I'm sure, I mean, outside in of Birmingham? Indian. In Birmingham, in England, they are famous for their Indian food. And I actually went there um, with, oh, who was the other actor? I can't remember. Not a supernatural person. And we had the most amazing, it, I think it was like cashew curry or something. It was just like the best thing I've ever eaten. And it was very, yeah. not a fancy place. So if you're ever in Birmingham, England, uh, Jim, do you like Indian food? Nope. Great. So you're going to be set. Um, I love Sam. it. I've been there several times. I never knew this. I missed that somehow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do you, where are you going to be, Sam? I have my calendar. Cause um, I want our paths to cross. This is why I'm right? asking. Cause I want to know okay. where we're going to be at the same place. So the first week of August, I'm going to be in Arkansas. Oh, ABC it's, um, NWA Northwest Arkansas con. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a couple weeks after that, I'm going to be in Kansas city, Missouri at, uh, planet comic con that's one of my favorite cons i'm a, a really? little bit jealous and i wish i was going because i know that there's a lot of spm people going and i'm a little yes bit jealous. i'm excited i'm excited yeah. i wish you were coming you know maybe i can pull some strings please please that would be the best come stay with me i would um, love it and then the week i literally have four weeks in a row then i have louisiana comic con which is wow. in it's not in i can't remember which it's not in new orleans right no no uh, I can't remember where. And then the weekend after that is Dragon Con, which I know. Oh, I'm going to be a Dragon Con. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. Hi, Hi, and I'm bringing my baby because uh, I have relatives in Atlanta. So one of the reasons why I'm going is that my uh, my grandmother, so her great grandmother has never met her after as a four year old. Oh. So I'm pretty excited to go. Also Dragon Con. Those are, yeah, Pelican Comic Con, Dragon Con. I'm going to be in Cincinnati. There's 
There's like some that are like the best, you know, like Rose City. Although, I, yeah, I don't know if Rose City. Rhode Island is great. I love Rhode um, Island. Salt Lake City. F Fan X, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. so Fan X, really, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of great ones. And then um, yeah. la uh, right after that, the last one for this little stretch is winding it up with Creation in Orlando. <gasps> Orlando makes me worried, though. I'm we'll see if it, we'll see if it happens. I mean, I know uh, yeah. any of these could, I think, you know, depends on how COVID goes. Yeah. Sam Smith. Oh my God. You have a beautiful voice. Sandy Doggo says that's very nice. Okay. Let me do oh, some questions because we're, we're I, I mean, I could talk to you guys for hours. I'm not kidding. And I'm so glad Same. just, just wonderful things. No, no one's going to be doing a favorite line in Supernatural. I'm not going to have to do that. Okay. How, um, what experience do you care? This is a good one because it is Supernatural. But what experience do you carry with you in your career that you learned filming Supernatural? Because y'all were on, like, what was your first season, Jim? Season one. Season one. You were in season yeah. one. So, and you were in season one, Sam, and like many, many seasons toward the end. Like, this has been a journey. This is a lifelong job. <laughs> Jim, yeah. were you in every season? I was in every season. Yeah. That's a lot. Sometimes, sometimes only once. But uh, right. um, I was in I was in a lot the first seven seasons and then it tapered off for a while. Yeah. But it was always at least once. Yeah. I came on in seven. So maybe that mm. was, hopefully it wasn't my fault because I was only in like two or three <laughs> a season. But well, then, spoiler they, alert. They, they couldn't afford two beautiful people. It's true. We didn't want the can't, you know, Brad couldn't pull focus on both of our faces and everybody. <laughs> right. Uh, I miss all of them. You know, every time I I, I, I search one of the crew, I think everybody has to understand that the Supernatural set was a very unique set in that the crew behind the scenes was as familiar and friendly with each other and family as in front of the camera. And that's just not often the case. You don't normally right. see regular actors hanging out with camera people and makeup people on the weekends. And that kind of family atmosphere, I think, really was the heartbeat of the show. So, like, whenever I see, like, oh, you know, uh, a couple of people went to Nancy Drew and then some of them are on Legend of Tomorrow, you're like, I really hope I work on that set just so I can yes. work with that yeah. set designer or whatever, right? Yeah. I love the I mean, people. We ever made friendly with a ton of the people from that from the crew yeah and it was it was in in large part the same crew for 15 mm -hmm. years 15 years exactly exactly yeah. and it's it's just so it also makes you just feel better as an actor that you're not just like having strangers stare at you looking you're at their safe. phone you're just like oh this is a person who i know who what their kids you know what their kids do i know what what their favorite restaurant is in vancouver we've maybe been there you're like that that really just makes it seamless so that your pretending is more rooted in reality because you are in a reality that you like. I don't know. That's how I felt a little bit. Well, I also felt like everyone had your back, right? So yeah, you could yeah. talk to Moira or Kelly or anybody be like, can I have that and this? And they would, they'd help you. So everything mm -hmm. they were doing to help made you better and made the show better. And then, and it was, it was all a collaborative effort. There wasn't like, anyone who was more or less important than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's its a weird thing to say, but there's hierarchies of importance on a set and the actors are always like up there, especially like while you're on set, you know? And it's just, some people project that and some people do not. And so uh, I guess the one thing I take away from the set is that I think the equality of everybody on a film set is important and they're people and they can be uh, your friend um, and Nobody's better than anybody in the job that they have. It's just a different set of skills and we're all making something together. So honor that and treat people well and also just yeah. be be friends with everybody. And be know. welcoming to new people, whether they're for a day or whether they're there for the season. And everyone is better and more comfortable. The work is better. I mean, if the goal is, because we're there at a job, right? Mm -hmm. If the goal is the best work we can do, yeah, everyone does their best when they feel comfortable and safe. And we've, I'm sure of the three of us have all been on a set where that was not the case. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Oh, many times. Yes. I mean, I've, just, just, I've been, I've been cried. I, I think three makeup people in my career made me cry. And, and I'm yeah. just like, why, why yeah. do, do you have to do this to this? Because yeah. again, it's a hierarchy. So if you're a day player, it's actor, I think this is what messes with all of our head as an actor. We're either 
the best, most important thing on a set and everyone caters to your whims or you are dirt. Like if you're, a dirt, <laughs> you're dirt, you know, and it's like the psychology where you're Needy always dirt. like, you're, you're, yeah, you're always kind of ping ponging back and forth between, and it's hard to be a guest in anybody's house, but especially when it's a work house where you've seen people be fired on a dime. Like, I don't know, Jim, have you ever done a sitcom? Yeah, yeah, my first series was a sitcom. And, what? Uh, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it was back in the 90s. It was called Thunder Alley, and I played Ed Asner's idiot sidekick. <laughs> what? Uh, I want to see this now! <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, that's, that's a very different kind of world, uh, doing sitcom. And uh, it's... But that's, it's, it's pretty easy to get that kind of feeling you were just talking about with the cast and crew and everybody being a family mm -hmm. on a show like that. And, uh, and it's been 25 years since I did that show and I'm still very close with everybody on it. Oh, that's um, amazing. Yeah, and I that's think because it's always the case. Yeah, because you know, a multi, it's not like I'm sure we've all had jobs where we're like, okay, this is a job. Let me get off the set as soon as I can. Yeah. Because either one of the actors is a jerk or that just the atmosphere. Like I did an episode of House and it wasn't terrible, but everybody was just on edge. And I was yeah. like, I don't know who on the set is the one who blows up or is erratic or moody. And I I'm not going to point out anybody that I worked with, but you could tell there's just one person that makes it not fun. And I'm just like, yeah. that's not fun. I mean, it's not good for anybody's work at the end of the day. That's the thing that made Supernatural particularly good is that you had uh, two lead actors who uh, who really never uh, made anybody sorry they were on the show. Never. Uh, who uh, or were all loosey-goosey with whether you were there for your first day or you were there for your 15th season. They, it was all, it, they treated you like like either family or very welcome guests, and uh, uh, and it was cordial and it was loose. And yeah. the looseness, I think, considering how hard everybody worked on the show, the looseness of the work, it was kind of extraordinary uh, yeah. because you would gather from looking at us goofing around that we weren't getting anything done, but we were getting things done. We were getting a really good show done. But there was no sense of uh, uh, somebody's going to die if we don't get this right. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's not brain surgery, but it is family. And yeah. well, you took the work seriously, but not ourselves. And I think that that yeah. let us um, laugh. And if you're relaxed, then you can work hard without being like, yeah, I can't tell you because I kind of got my training. I mean, I never was a big like I was always like second, third choice for everything. And because uh, I would get so I nervous. We all were. I know exactly. But I, I have a real anxiety problem. So I kind of self sabotage every time I've tested. I was just like falling apart. So I booked a lot of commercials because I didn't care. I would have like 10 commercial auditions every week and I would make a huge, you know, I, I was very successful because um, I just didn't care and I would just show right. up and have a goof and they would hire me. But at the end of the day, I've never been treated worse than by commercial directors because they, you're a, you're a human meat bag. Okay. Like just pick you up. Are, the, yeah. yeah. You need to, you need to hit this and it needs to be exactly like, if you don't like put the product, if the product doesn't look great, they're all like touching up the product and you're like, can I get some powder? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> But if you have that sort of contempt, then you feel like, or like the couple of times I did multicam, you know, seeing somebody get fired right next to you. Cause I can't believe they didn't fire you, Sam. Like you didn't, they <laughs> should have. I, felt. I just can't believe it. <laughs> Every day I'd go home and I was like, well, that was so fun. <laughs> oh, well. Every day. Every wow. day. But I mean, speaking of people being horrible, I can't say what show it was, but there was a show where I got that call one night. And I'd been booked for two episodes of a sitcom and I got a call from my agent. He said, normally this call is the call that you've been replaced, but you need to up your game. You're not hacking it. You're, 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 they're giving you one more chance tomorrow. And the next morning I was horrified, of course. Terrified. 
And I marched right up to the director and I was like, I will do whatever. Like, what do I, what am I doing wrong? How do I fix it? And he literally looked at me and he goes, what are you talking about? Because the woman on the show tried to get me fired. Uh, what? Yes. So this talk about sets that are not welcoming and friendly yeah. and yeah. So wait, you the one of the actors on the show wanted called to get the you producer. Fired, so called the producer and complained about you and the producer. Said she's not cutting her. it. She needs to. And the director well. was like, "You're fine. What are you talking about?" Oh no, <laughs> y'all, uh, y'all, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Un unreal, it's but not unreal road, because I've heard so here. many worse. I've heard so many worse. And that's the thing about it, you know, like that is one of the things in this industry that is a lot of people are being called out for the behavior, showrunners, people. But yeah. to this day, I know people working right now who are like, oh, this showrunner is a nightmare. He keeps yelling at everybody. Oh, this actor is a total awful person. They're going to sleep during other people's coverage. And like, this is this week, last week. And so, you know, there is an institution that just wants to get it done and they don't really care how it gets done. And so, because if there was accountability, then people would, the network or the bosses would be like, you can't behave like this. You can't fall asleep on somebody's coverage. You can't <laughs> yell at somebody. You can't be a toxic, awful person. But I think this, this industry is trained to kind of take care of whatever. If it stays on rails, it doesn't matter how it does. And I think that's really destructive and terrible, especially for people who are most vulnerable because they're going to get all the poop that rains out on their head, right? And that's going to be the beginner people and the people who are probably marginalized from marginalized Powerless. backgrounds and all of this. Yeah, it's really upsetting. I, I wonder though, how much... How, sorry, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, go, go I ahead, fall Jim. asleep during my own coverage. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about you, Jim. It's a, it, it's not a, This is actually an intervention. Uh, it's, <laughs> we've, had, we have, we've had some reports. It's about time. Um, we have, I just want to get a couple more questions before we end. Kim Rhodes is going to be here at the top of the hour, you guys. I want to thank all of you for, you have so many questions, but I like talking to my friends too much. I'm not going to get to all of them. If you weren't acting, what would you do? Starlet Nack, Nick asks. Not what you did want to do when you were younger, but if you had to stop acting now, what would you do instead? Education notwithstanding. So you could do whatever it is. Brain surgery. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I would... I did a little bit of interior design and I think I'd go into rehabbing houses and doing <gasps> interiors. Oh, that'd be good. Like mm. rebuilding, like uh, renovating antique houses. That's one of my favorite shows on HGTV is the, the Detroit woman. Should, what is that called, you guys? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I don't even watch that stuff. I just, I just want to do it. I'm going to link you the, I'm going to link you the show, uh, okay. the, the show I love. And then you're going to tell me who that person is to try to fire you off the Okay. Jim, what yes, about you? <laughs> uh, I, to try and come up with a serious answer, I, I, would, I would probably just devote myself to writing. Well, you um, are an incredible writer. Like you've had yes. many books well, published, correct? Yeah. And I've well, read them. They're, they're, the, they're wonderful. I, I, it's, it's hard work. It's a lot harder work than acting. So yep. yes. I'm not the in discipline. a hurry. I'm not in a hurry to uh, depend fully on that, but um, uh, the fact is, it's um, it's something I can manage to do if I if I uh, get off my butt and do it. And um, I can't think of anything else I'd want to do. Yeah, no, me neither. I think uh, <laughs> my backup plan. Well, streaming. So my dream is to move to Europe, do streaming. <laughs> and do um, do my streaming, write, and have, and we talked about this before, I'm gonna to move to Portugal and have a bakery. It's like, a, I wanna go and open the doors. It's gonna be like a, a Nora Ephron movie. Well, I'll open the doors and like, it's all adorable, but it's really <clears throat> dusty, but only in a superficial way. And then I just dust it off and I'd be like, I'm gonna learn how to make croissants. And then I start this little expat bakery in the middle of Portugal, but I'm not open all the time because it's just at my convenience and sure you like it am i painting yeah. a picture yeah i dig it we want to live in holland so we'll come visit wait why do you want to live in holland 
I just, I love that part of the world. I think that I'm, I'm part Dutch. Um, so I'm, a, I have an affinity for it, even though I don't speak Dutch or know any, you know, of my Dutch family. <laughs> I just, I love the mentality there. I, I think they're genius. I love the, the way they run their schools and they're the best engineers in the world. And um, there's tulips and <laughs> it's close. It's close to the rest of Europe. You know, it's, it's right there. <laughs> really I mean, high standard quality of living. Yeah, it is true. And you have like a lot of resources. I love design houses, uh, design TV shows. And like some of the most cool like renovations or original constructions are from Netherlands. So yes. I think you'd be in good company. What about you? This is our wrap up question because Kim mm -hmm. is in the wings waiting. So Yay, Kim. Jim, where would you live if you could live anywhere under any circumstance? Where would you live? Italy. Oh, yeah. I've got uh, I've got a real feel for Italy, and um, uh, I mean it might not be. <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time there, but I can't say I know what it's like to actually live there, and it could all be an illusion. But the illusion is really cool. Well, you know, so I'm kind of obsessed with Instagrams. Um, <laughs> they have a bunch of Instagram accounts where you basically it features cheap houses and i can't tell you how many cheap houses there are in italy in fact there are many cities that will pay you i saw an article yesterday about a city that's paying people thirty three thousand dollars to come and live in the city so like this could be a very low cost entry for you yeah this is, yeah this is my dream for you jim yeah well all i gotta do is uh talk my family into going with me <laughs> yeah, you might probably Italy. Who would want they to might have Italy? some other ideas about where they want to live. Well, your your so, kiddo is in what? So first first year of college or what? No, she's she's finishing she's finishing up her last semester at AMDA in uh, New York. Oh wow! So you're <clears> actress <throat> actor. Yeah. Now I would I would love for you to leave us the advice that you give gave her to get into acting because I know a lot of people love acting. And they well, I didn't. Give, I didn't advise her to get into it. Um, but what do you I do? Said, I, you know, I just told her to read everything she can get her hands on: plays, scripts, biographies, mm -hmm. theater history. Know what you're doing. Know what the world is before you dive into it. Amazing. And and never make anybody sorry they hired you. Yeah, I think I've probably done that a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. You know, again. I was an idiot and I didn't know what I was getting into and I did not know what I was doing. And like a lot of it was like, can I do this? What would you like me to do? I'm a, I'm a human puppet. Like now, at least I feel like I've gotten some opinions, but early on, it's all about your opinions and your point of view. And if you can convey that, then you're, you're kind of gold. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank I you for having us. Oh my gosh. You guys are brilliant. I could talk for hours. Such a pleasure. It's so good to see you, Sam. You too, Jim. It's been too long. It has. Hopefully we'll all have our paths cross at some wonderful place where we can see see fans, but also see each other because it really is a pleasure. Um, Likewise. Supernatural is a family and it never, it never will end. All right. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second hour of my amazing live stream with some of my favorite people in the world. This is my podcast, Felicitations Live. And Boy, oh boy, do we have an incredible guest for our second hour. I am so, I so adore this woman, not because, not only because she is incredible what she does, and she is an uh, incredible example of somebody who has an uh, just amazing a career, but also is super grounded, super loving, creates community wherever she goes, and is just smart, smart, smart. I will never forget our traveling back. We were in Europe or something and we're traveling together. Best, I, if I were going to do, um, that, uh, that reality show where you have the, what is that one called? Where you travel everywhere with some, one other person. I think she would be probably top five that I would choose. Anyway, the wonderful, stupendous Kim Rhodes. Hi, Kim. Hi. I hey. have to tell you. And likewise, we'll go, we can go anywhere. I'll go anywhere with you. I'm amazing down. race, amazing race. We could do amazing race together, couldn't we, Kim? I would. Okay, I, 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 as we were discussing before this, I'm old and tired. If they came up with like an amazing saunter. Um, amazing saunter. Amazing, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing wander aimlessly. That yeah. I, I could do that. 
Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, also, they always make you once a season always eat something weird. And I'm not into eating grubs. I'm just not going to do it. I don't care how much you pay oh. me or what platform you put me on. Do we both have to do it? I'll eat the weird things. Wait, so you're okay with eating weird stuff? My growth tolerance is remarkably high. What's the grossest thing you've ever eaten? Like on a dare? Have you eaten sweetbreads and stuff like that? Yeah. Um... I don't like that's weird. What have I even eaten that's gross? I mean, you know, like, like have you eaten fried crickets or no? I totally like would. I hear they are a little like, like, uh, like Rice Krispies. Yeah, they're crunchy because they're just. I mean, if you think about it, like I love soft shell crab, and that's just a big bug, right? It's just a big yeah. bug. So I could just well, eat no. roly polies. It's an arachnid. Yeah, it's an arach. It's like it's a, a crab is not an. It's arachnid. No, it's not going to be, but like there's eight, don't they have eight? Isn't it more like a spider than a bug? Is it? I hope I have an entomologist slash marine biologist in chat who could inform us make of that. Help, make someone fix me. It does have eight legs. It does have, crustaceans have 10 legs, okay? I, I, I have oh. a mod who is an authority in this. It's an arthropod, okay? It's a crustacean. Cricket tastes like chicken not all right you're not helping chat i'm not looking at you anymore kim how are you <laughs> i'm exhausted why are you exhausted i need to hear all of it so loopy i am doing i have for a year now i've been working at a barn so i am this yeah your, no this I'm, is like a covid life change what's going on i mean it kind of was it, it wasn't it wasn't on purpose but it, but it happened and I just went with it. I'm like, okay, I guess this is what I do now. Um, so I, I teach writing lessons to small children and, uh, and I'm exhausted in particular right now because last week, this week and next week, I'm also running the camp. So in the morning from eight to two, I'm in charge of 24 children and four horses. That's a and lot then to do. starting at you two, my lessons start. So I've got I've got kids I'm teaching one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. I need to hear all about this because this but is, that's, the, that's, that's what they got. I mean, because, but, but one of the questions was what have you picked up during COVID that it was the first one I asked Jim and Sam who both say hi to you. Um, and yeah, they're pretty great. They're not here anymore, but they're pretty great. Uh, pretty and, great. and I mean, Jim had nothing, but Jim's crotchety. And then Sam has her sewing and her amazing crafts. So yours is writing? A complete and utter lifestyle change. Yes. Yes. I now work at a barn. But you used to ride anyway for fun, right? And you had your own horse. That's yes. what I remembered that part. It was, so my horse was a leaf. So it's like you timeshare an animal. Um, and when COVID- Is there an app for that? <laughs> the, right? <laughs> Just looking for a horse to rent just want to split it six ways this morning <laughs> the horse is like no no, no. beginner beginner friendly beginner friendly um uh so yeah when 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 things started going south for me i couldn't afford my lease anymore and i was How like is this south is this have... just acting is this an acting issue because yeah. you didn't work as much acting Yes, that is a very kind way of putting it. No, that's horrible because you're so talented. You're incredible. That makes me sad and hate this industry. But oh. hey, I haven't worked in a year and a half either. So it it yeah it ha it ha it happens, and we have a we have a shelf life in this industry, especially as women. Yep. And nobody gives you a pink slip. Nobody is like, "This is your last job, and now you can retire." But at some point, you go, "Yeah, well, I don't, I don't even have health insurance anymore. Yep. Oh, I can't." I have a 76 cent residual check yep. and I remember it because it's the only one I've had for a while. So, uh -huh. um, so I, I, so I was like, I, there's only so many of my mom's jewels that I'm willing to sell to keep affording my horse. And they said, well, do you want to teach? And I said, when you'll let me keep riding? They said, yes. I said, I am in. What? And so it started as like this thing. And then it turns out, I actually do not suck at it. You're incredible. Um, I mean, you're incredible. You're a mentor. You're, a, I mean, if anything I ever would have 
thought that you have this incredible talent is inspiring and mentoring other people. You do have that it's, incredible quality. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I'm doing. That's what I get to do now. I have these little people. And the best thing is because, um, I mean, so the, so the, and then camp camp is, yeah. is really, uh, very, it, it's great for me. It's fun. I'm finding a lot of talents. I didn't know I have, I'm finding a lot of skills that weirdly like conventions taught me, like knowing when to put a button on something. Mm -hmm. Like there's the applause line. Let's move on now. <laughs> yeah. Just working it. Um, Amazing. So, and, and so yeah. So, so is I'm, it I'm, you? I'm horses and kids. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, it's obviously not. I mean, what, what makes me sad is that you. It feels like I don't mean to get too deep, but it's like you give. Ha, is part of your heart given up on acting, a little bit, mm -hmm. or is it just yes? So, but you still have an I, agent. No, I. I don't know. No, Kim. Don't know. I want to do. I want to. I want to get this career back on track because you're too damn gorgeous and talented not to be working. And, I, and people tell me this all the time, and I'm like, okay, you should be on TV more. I'm like, show me how. Okay, that is how yeah. acting is. It's, but it's it's honestly, I haven't closed the door to it, but I'm not. I I I I was like, oh. Finally, I can let go of like really holding on to what's the, what it's almost, almost, oh, I'm, oh, I'm so, I'm so, and now I can just yeah. be like, I'm going to eat whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Twitch, it's fine. Twitch, it's fine. It's I'm sorry, <laughs> Twitch. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm going to eat whatever I want and I'm, I let my Botox leave and I'm going to let my hair be gray and your hair looks going to be bitching. Okay. It I is do. so I'm, sexy. I'm going to be feral. Well, you can, you put yours really super short, right? I did before, but this, and, well, you know, last year it was like down to booby level. And then I just like, you know what, this is where I'm going. I just took new Kim. I took my last, I, I I'm going to associate with you a little bit. Um, that, I, this is my oh. last set of headshots I'm taking. I just got my uh, one la last, and that's going to be it. If I don't get some work, I mean, this will be it. It'll probably skate me maybe five years, but maybe not. And I'm just like, I'm okay with it because the year of COVID, not having that sort of desperation, not having the complete rejection, not having the thing where, where I'm like, I want to be okay with the way I look, regardless of what I think other people think about me is so liberating and wonderful. It's a sensation that I don't want to let go of. And I don't want to get dragged back to that place where we start, I start feeling insecure and feeling like I'm not enough. And then I get so nervous and I betray myself and I hate myself afterwards. It's this horrible cycle that for 20 years almost, because I started when I was looking, you know, it's been there and to be unhooked from it, was it, was COVID sort of like this psychological shift for you in that way? Cause it was for me. It it was, it was a beautiful, it, it, it was a beautiful, uh, perfect storm. Um, for me, what happened last year in May, cause my, my daughter is autistic. And so I had a bunch of downtime with my daughter. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to get informed. Um, and so I met a couple of really lovely people in England. One is an, is a doctor and one is an advocate um, both are autistic and they were, they really kind of enveloped me and were helping me a lot with my daughter. And they suggested that I take, um, some of the tests that my daughter would have taken, like kind of go through the same process and get in touch with like the experience that she had was, was how I understood it. And so I took all the tests and, um, I'm super autistic. And so I was like, I'm autistic. I'm autistic. Right? Because the first test I took was not a credible result. And they were like, which test did you take? I'd taken the wrong one. And um, and I was, I wanted so badly because it all made sense. And then once I was like, wow. And, and they, apparently, then they said, because uh, the Dr. Chloe said, yeah. I asked Harry, has she talked to you about her own neurodivergence? And he said, I don't think she knows. Like it was so obvious to them. And I just, so this is by way of answering your question. I'm, I'm following this, I'm following the thread back. 
So it wasn't so much COVID as it was me realizing that so much of my anxiety and deep belief of what I should be was actually a neurotypical bias. And once I gave myself permission to be neurodivergent and start taking masks off, I realized that all of these things I, I thought I wanted to be and shapes I wanted to conform to are just impossible. It's just, it's just my internalized ableism. You're blowing my mind right now because when you said, I'd love to talk about late diagnosis autism, I thought it was because of your kiddo. I thought, oh, maybe she was like five or six. Like the fact that you were talking about yourself right now. 50, 50. Is incredible. So you have been diagnosed as neurodivergent on the spectrum. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I, I don't know all the terminology. I would love for you to yeah. educate me. And because I have no, I've never heard of someone who was older to be, I, a lot it's of my friends. Very have, Okay. So the term diagnosis mm-hmm. uh, is a very specific term. I have not been diagnosed as autistic okay. because it needs an American doctor and an American doctor who is capable of diagnosing a developmental disability, which is what autism is classified as, huh. generally start around $10,000. Um, wow. My daughter's work up was $16,000. Wow. I am picking up horse poop so that I can feed my family ramen. Um, so that's, that's the word around a, an actual diagnosis. Yes. And then with that, there's a lot of question of why do we need neurotypical approval to stamp our neurodivergent experience? Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. That's also part. So I am comfortable claiming um, mm-hmm. neurodivergence. I'm comfortable saying am I autistic. I cannot clinically say I have been diagnosed. Gotcha. And I understand that there are people that will be like, then it's BS. Yeah. And um, you're welcome to feel that way. I don't care. Actually. Well, clearly you <laughs> have a lot to, I mean, you have a child who is, I, when, when was your child diagnosed in a sense? He was absolutely diagnosed. She was diagnosed at the age of four. Four. Wow. Yeah. And the more I discover about the uh, disability, the more autism would explain a lot of what my father uh, experienced. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, in retrospect, we could see, I mean, uh, I don't know, I don't know enough about autism to know about like genetic lineage and all this thing. And, you know, I'm sure it is something that a lot of people are studying. But it's certainly interesting to notice when you when you're familiar with actual um, uh, things uh, about either uh, something like this, then you can kind of see like, oh, that's very interesting. Because I mean, I didn't know I had an anxiety disorder until I was like over thirty, and like it literally ruled my life in a way where I was hampered in so so many ways. And and the minute I actually started adding it up and investigating it and getting help um, in treatment and slowly but surely coming toward a medication, you know, delaying it way, way farther than I should have because I would have been a lot more functional had I been diagnosed a lot earlier. Um, You know, they're all things that kind of add up your past in a way that you never could have added up before because you just didn't have the puzzle pieces to put it together. Yep. Is that how you feel when you look back at some of the things that frustrated you, but you didn't understand why? Oh, so much. It all makes so much sense. I'm like, oh, you sweet, sweet little bunny. Try it. Like, because, because it's interesting. A lot of people associate autism with deficiency. Mm-hmm. So when I told people, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm autistic. I got one of two responses down the line. My husband not accepted because my husband is beautiful and wonderful. and is, But I either got yeah and or I got no you're not oh yep people because I was like listen who is the one uh, who's the one that when we're sitting around talking about vulnerable moments in our life when we felt a little scared and I'm like 
I throw getting raped on the table. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that how we're bonding? Isn't that, we're, I did, I did not, that was wrong. That was, that's, I did wrong. But that was my grotesquely oversharing because yeah. they don't understand where boundaries are. Mm-hmm. Um, hyper um, empathy where I don't know where your feelings end and mine begin. Over, like you're too much, you're over dramatic, you're too, you're too loud, you're just too, you're too. And meanwhile, I do, I'm trying really hard to be small. I don't, I don't know, I don't have the same scale as other people. Yeah. Um, and a lot of like, there's, there's, I would joke with, with Brianna, um, because classically, you know, it's like, well, if, you could any question that starts with if I am going to go down the rabbit hole of well was I born in a different reality can I change back to this can I did we get, like if you start with an if I, I can't I I can't and it helps me I saw somebody the other day in a shirt that said be specific I'm autistic I was like <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible that's incredible parents at this at camp will be like what's your background I understand you want to ask me a specific question. Will you please ask me the specific question? Because I'm either going to tell you everything. <laughs> my background is a painting, or I'm going to say, well, I was born in Portland, Oregon in 1969. And then, I, and I'm uh, like, it's yeah. Funny. You want to know if I'm going to keep your kid from dying today because you're nervous about how scattered I seem? Mm-hmm. Great. That's yeah. a valid question. So I have a question because I'm ignorant about it and I'm not sure if you have an answer. So I've always, what I know from little I know about uh, autism is that on the spectrum, there there's class of people use the term Asperger's syndrome. So is that on the high, do I know any, I don't know anything about how that works. Right. Although I I'm, love that you said this. Okay. Many people hear the word spectrum but see a visual ladder i do too yes it's like a heat line or something right yes that is not my experience and that is not what the autistic community would like people to see it is a color wheel Mm -hmm. it is a spectrum Mm -hmm. um and so classifying high functioning low functioning is like classifying blue as more of a color than red Got you. But we tend to discuss our support needs. Now, when you see someone whose support needs are met, my disability is not obvious. However, if you see me when my support needs are not met, I am clearly in distress and I'm in distress in a very atypical way. Um, The other thing is in terms of the word functioning, Mm -hmm. most people mean that as functioning like typical people typical society. well yeah because it's using a relative you are functioning compared to how we the normative exactly which is very relative and also very insulting because you're using a measure that why should that be the measure right exactly exactly that's that's the you know uh uh oh the analogy went away from my head but yes so I, I want very much to speak only for myself, mm-hmm. but um, I understand the the term Asperger's is no longer considered something that we like because of the Nazi reference. Okay, great. Um, I'm being educated a lot. I really do apologize. I have, no. <laughs> uh, this is something that I'm new and I will throw it out. Okay, let's throw Asperger's out because a lot of people are... Um, telling me also in chat that it was uh, used to be used as a terminology and is now. Now there is a spectrum that people are, I suppose, diagnosed with or placed on. I'm not even sure the terminology. So please, please it's, feel it's free in to terms correct of me. Support needs. Yes. Um, it's okay. Support needs and uh, and where I most like. I, I, I think it's also what I experience. Like some of us, I have 
sensory issues. I did not know I had sensory issues. Mm -hmm. I just knew things made me crazy. And why wouldn't people stop making the noises? And why won't you talk louder? Because there's music over there. And you know, I can't hear you when there's music playing. Mm -hmm. um, it It's processing disorder. There's a number of things they, I believe, um, just in terms of neurodivergence itself, uh, uh, ADHD is now mm -hmm. considered is under the umbrella. PTSD oh. is under the umbrella. Anything that is wiring our brain away from what is considered a typical function. Mm -hmm. um, but in, I want to go back and I want to be really clear, Felicia. I don't believe anyone needs to apologize for not knowing something before they learned it. No, no, I, I, I appreciate you that. Know? And I love the fact that I can be educated. Our chat can be educated. Uh, I even have somebody in chat. I love Kim. I literally went through this throughout quarantine because I'm studying psychology and I learned that I'm also autistic and everything makes sense now. So this is an incredible, incredible revelation for you, especially being the mother of an autistic child. Like how is this how has this been between you and her? How has this connection deepened your relationship? How does she see you in a different light? Like, is there any dynamic change between you two? In a while, it, 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 yes. the dynamic has shifted on, on my end because no matter how much I may believe she's not doing something on purpose, if it feels personal, I want her to change it. Mm -hmm. And so dialing it back and dialing back the demands and dialing back the demands. And now when I'm, when we are 15 minutes late and I have tweezers and a necklace and I'm trying to squeeze the link, it's not a necklace I'm wearing, not a necklace I'm ever going to wear. I just discovered a link with it. And my husband comes in and goes, what, what are you doing? And I just look up and say, I have to do this. And he says, okay. <laughs> and we wait and like, I can't not, I can't not. If the house were on fire, I would think twice. And I would probably take the tweezers and the necklace with me and finish it outside once I knew the animals were safe. Wow. Um, and that helps me with her because she can't not now where we can have a little dicey is when her she can't not and i my i can't not and our because ultimately for both of us we experience our autism with a lot of anxiety attached mm -hmm. so i'm sure you can relate once the anxiety gets triggered the logical this i should not be having this large of a reaction doesn't matter yeah i'm on fire and she's, and so what I've just gotten much better at doing is just stepping away. Mm -hmm. And I say, I can't function when I feel like this. I give myself permission to step away. And she now, she used to come after me because I wouldn't step away until we'd reached 11. Yeah. Now I step away at a three and oh, she understands so and lets me go. Yeah. And I was corrected again in chat. Um, it is... People are saying that uh, not autistic child is child with autism. So, no, absolutely not. We prefer autistic. Okay. So the autistic community does not like any more than you would say a person with deafness. Mm -hmm. It is a deaf person. Okay, um, great. Because no, I appreciate the emotion that comes with this. Um, but a disability is not the same thing as a disease. So the autistic community that I am a part of feels um, that I would, I would prefer to be called autistic than a person with autism. Also because we think very literally and all of a sudden I'm carrying around a little satchel that's named your autism. autism in it. And <laughs> here's Kim with autism and I've left yeah. my autism in the car today. That said, if there are people with autism who prefer that, oh, cool. Then yeah. that's who you are and that's how I will refer to you. But in general, the autistic community that I am familiar with overall prefer to be called autistic rather than people with autism. Amazing. I, I feel like I'm my whole world is being opened up by you. And I just want to thank you for that. And also creating a discussion in the chat and also just being so transparent about it. And the fact that 
you do see seem so um, free in a way and em embodied in yourself. And I think that it's so you're you're like, first of all, you're glowing and you're so gorgeous, but you always are. It's a sense of settledness and wholeness in you that I, I haven't seen before. And I just want, I don't know. Do you think, do you feel that way? <laughs> it, so there's a, um, I do. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for seeing it. I think we've always like, for as little time as we get to spend with each other, I think we see each other like, mm -hmm. like, oh, there, you're my people. Yeah. And um, you're one of those people who I'm like, we could not see each other for five years. I'd be like, oh, we're right there. You know, I, I don't know why yeah, that good. is. We are. I don't feel like we're best friends or anything, but you there is. I think sometimes people meet other people who don't have as many barriers between each other's souls or something. And so sometimes you just fit and you're just like, I just I feel like we could hang out at any time, whatever circumstance. So when I say you glow, I feel like your soul feels very whole in a sense. And I just I'm curious to as to what my perception of that, do you feel that after all this experience? I, I do. I think a lot of it is, again, the permission. Once I realized that what I was, I thought I was trying to attain a goal. I thought mm -hmm. I was trying to become someone and get something. And in this new framework, I realized what I was doing was masking, which is a learned behavior that came from a feeling of danger. So hmm. it isn't a deliberate lie. A lot of people are like, you can let your mask down. Like, I don't know if I'm doing it on purpose. Yeah. But as I look at myself in this new framework, I am allowed to be more authentic because the first step of going, I need to become this thing so that I'm safe mm -hmm. was just taken away from me. You're never going to be that thing. Yeah. So once that was gone and I was left with this, now I'm able to just kind of go, oh, what is my truth as opposed to what do you want me to be so that yeah, I'm okay? There's a, a, a sense of walking around so careful that you don't show yourself to the world because you might mess up. And that's how I always approach acting because I always went into a situation, I don't know, you know, it's when I'm under pressure, I betray myself, right? And whether there's deeper problems that I need to go to, but mostly it was the anxiety. So walking into certain situations, I'm just like, okay, I wish I, I have my armor on, but it it's the armor that doesn't allow your authentic self to be there because you feel like your authentic self is either going to betray you or just not be accepted. Right. And yep. there's a certain freedom in, you know what, this is me. If you don't like me, it's, it's, I don't, I, it's always something that I've aspired in my life to achieve. And I feel like I have a glimpse of it now. And when you have it, you just want to kind of eat it up. <laughs> it feels nice. It's, it's a good, and, and I'm not, I don't, that it isn't my bar. It's not where my bar is set. And it certainly is something that slips away. And then I lie in bed and cry and say, I don't understand why I'm taking up air on this planet. Yeah. I do that too. Mm -hmm. Regularly. Um, not, not as regularly as I used to, but I've done it within the last week. And those were the words I said, um, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm breathing oxygen that better people need. <laughs> That's a terror. It's a horrible feeling. It really is. And this is not the world, you know, it's funny how COVID can bring out the best and the worst. I mean, obviously during this time, you've discovered so much about yourself, but also the pressures, the financial, the emotional the physical pressures of it all. Oh. Um, it has been testing everybody on every level. And what, now that we're opening up, you know, I've gotten a lot of, you know, just comments, people, even in cameos are just like, can you tell me it's going to be okay? Cause I am losing it. And I think that we all are underestimating the opening up the world is such a going to, it, it was jarring to be taken away from it. And then we go into emergency mode for a year and a half. And then suddenly Let's just go out and have a party. Like it's not most people's, a lot of people's brains at least can't handle that crazy shift. Also, our brain's finally relaxing and it's like, ah, oh, now you can feel the things that you've been suppressing for a year. It's a lot. Yes. Yes. Well, and we, it, we were in a, a primal survival mode. Yeah. As much as and we have been. I mean, of course, 2000 years ago, people's, you know, their villages or cities were being torn down. Everyone was being enslaved, like the ancient Greeks and the, you know, 
there's there's been our bad cities times are burning yes our cities are burning but we are injured yes are flooding. we have a lot going on in our society that is um atypical to what our, n- our norm is and whenever you have that sort of jarring of existence and roles and things like that your brain just starts hiccuping right and so yeah. Going through all that, I don't, I mean, is, is COVID kind of opening up? Is that affecting you at all? Um, and and are, now that you can be more aware of you as a person and how you react to things, um, do you notice things that you're having to adjust to in good or bad ways now that the world is getting a little more relaxed? I, um, Wow, no other words are coming to me. So I'm just going to say the ones that are there. I hate people a lot more than I thought I did. (laughs) I love individuals. There is not a person's eyes that I look into that I am not capable of loving. But I freaking hate. I recognize that what that is, is just, I've been alone with my own priorities for a year, right? Yeah, so for we all a year, have. I got to be with my priorities in my world and look at the unveiling of reality through my own personal lens. Mm-hmm. And now I'm back out and looking at other people whose priority is doing 75 when we're all doing 45. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure my priorities are right, but that's all it is, is that I've been alone with my priorities and I, and I lost those calluses. Yeah. I lost those, I lost those things where I'm just like, Oh, you're doing it differently. Oh, you're doing it differently. Oh, and instead I'm like, you just threw a cigarette out your window and it, I'm going to, I am going to, I'm, I'm going to follow you now. Yeah. It just, I don't have the, the, buffer that I used to have I mean no quite frankly like living I never thought I wouldn't want to live in a huge huge city like I love humanity I love experiences I love being exposed to so many people so many backgrounds some of this and and for the first time in my life I'm like you know might be okay to live in a farm like for the first time in my life because you're right I I never I have not heard it put so succinctly but being able to prioritize your own needs and your own being is very rare because especially in Hollywood, we are at service and our being is at, at, at service to other people to grab and use as they want and then move on. Because I mean, I've never been a, like a regular on a TV series, only my own. It was the only one that I haven't been written out of or killed or, you know, on hold maybe, but uh-huh. like no one's ever put a ring on it. So I've never felt like I belonged, right? And so, but I always had that desperate sense of like staring in the shop window, just wanting to be accepted, right? And so COVID forcing me to unplug from that made me realize how unhealthy I was seeing myself and my whole circumstances and how maybe there are other possibilities of being outside of always being on a shelf waiting to be picked up. Yeah, of allowing somebody else's definition of me to define my happiness. Yes, 100%. And I think having a kid, I don't know if this jarred you. I, your kid was what, 10, 11? 13, she's 13. <gasps> how did she I know. Go? I know, how did it happen? I know, I just, uh, and so, you know, it, it is, is a big world, but it, it also makes you prioritize yourself a little bit because you don't wanna make yourself diminished in front of this person who you are their, you are their world, right? And that's like a big pickup or just a big change in the way you see yourself. I don't know if you had that experience. It's a challenge. I'm torn between the way I was parented and the way I want to parent, which are two different things. Mm -hmm. Um, I was parented by a woman that I loved more than I loved light um but she was so deeply conditioned to be right to be proper to be on the outside what the world expected a lady to be and 
I was not. And now, of course, again, it makes sense. You get it. I was about to say that that I could be the child she wanted me to be because I, because I couldn't, but at the time, all I wanted was to be this child. My mom wanted me to be, and I kept failing. So then I turned into, you know, the Gothic child hanging out in bombed out buildings because <laughs> if I can't you know if I can't join them I might as well beat them yeah um and so I want to make sure that with my child she defines who she is and I own my mistakes yeah which were two things that were not present as I was parented but I don't have an example for what that looks like so there's a lot of flying blind in my parenting yeah. That I just, no, I, I, like, well, same yeah. thing with me. Yeah. And it's, 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 I, I a hundred percent would rather her be exactly who she is and have that sense of, cause I think when you are raised, I don't, I think we might have this in common where you feel a little hollow inside and you're always like building up layers on the outside of yourself, but there's not, you don't really know who you are inside because you're so focused on either controlling yourself or controlling the situation outside of you and how other people, you know, and it, it is the sort of hollow chocolate bunny kind of feeling. <laughs> and so the only thing I care about my kid is that she gets to discover who she is and be completely authentic to herself, whether it's beekeeping or art, being an artist or a doctor or literally, you know, or a masseuse. I don't care what she decides to do with herself as long as she wholly feels like she's doing the thing that she's meant to do and, and wants to do. That's beautifully put. I completely agree. Uh, Kiana asks, I, if you guys have a couple questions for um, Kim, uh, let me know. Obviously, there's some amazing things we're talking about here and of her discovery of herself and just life in general. Kiana asks, Kim, did trying to fit into a neurotypical world draw you to acting? Which I think is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Like in retrospect, like it, at, at the time, what? Uh, yes. What I wanted was to be able to have my big, 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 big feelings um, in a safe environment. And Mm -hmm. acting was the only place where I could have that. Because in the real world, when I would have big, 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 big feelings, I would be punished. You know, my family called them tantrums, but they were tantrums that now we know are autistic meltdowns. Yeah. So I had all of these huge feelings, but... I needed to know what the other person was going to say in order to feel safe expressing them. And in, ter- in the acting, that's exactly what you get to do. You get to have your big feelings, but there's a script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you kind of know what you're, what's going to happen. So you could just let it all go. Cause you know what the, it's almost like staying on a, on a freeway. You're like, Oh, I'm on a freeway. So I could drive. However we you're, you're playing Mario Kart, So, you know, you can't go off the edge. But you can drive however the hell you want on the on the. <laughs> um, what is the best thing that has come out of this diagnosis? Chelsea asks, which I I'm still so, um, so fascinated with this. I, I think this is a book you need to write about your journey um, here. Again, oh, I actually was gonna uh, off off air at some point. I've got I did I wrote a children's book that oh. my friend is illustrating. I'll send it to you because I think you'll like it. It's about a goat and a dog. Yes, um, please. But it's, about this it's about it's about a a a a goat who doesn't know and becomes yes Um, send it to me uh, i would say the best thing that's come out of this is not being so hard on myself just Mm. being much more gentle with oh that's why it's, I'm not broken. I'm different. And I've spent, you know, I spent half a century punishing myself for being broken because everybody else obviously could do this thing and was doing it perfectly well. And I was passing, I was faking wow. it. And even when I was faking it, everybody knew I was a little bit weird, <laughs> you know, a little, little bit, a little bit like, uh, um, and so now I have much more empathy for myself with just being like, oh, sweetie, of course you're the one who threw that reference in the, that was not, or, oh, no, that wasn't the joke. That's not funny. That's yeah, not. Yeah. It's kind of like funny. the older you get, you just want that parent to hug you 
and be like, I don't care what you're doing or who you are. I just, I love you exactly the way you are. And I tell my daughter that a lot, but like, I don't know if I had, I don't think I had that or that at least I didn't have that feeling as a kid. And so that's, I think what we always seek. And when somebody asked about the acting, I was like, yes, because I think half of actors get into this business because they're seeking a love that they can never get from whoever they're seeking it from. And so they seek it from strangers, yes. but those strangers are abusive. <laughs> they are. They're, the strangers who hire you as an actor are abusive. They're abusive strangers. Yes. But, well, the business and the art are two such drastically different things. Like no exactly. one gets into acting for the business of it. Everyone gets into acting for the art of it. And unfortunately, the business of it has to, you know, have a kidney in the process. Exactly. <laughs> Kim, somebody has a really great question. Um, you definitely should write a book. As someone who's struggling with sensory issues, your story would help a lot. If you're looking to publish, check out Inspired Girl Books. They're a lovely company. So I want Aww. you to write that down because I do think that, first of all, you're an incredible artist. And I know that we talked about screenplays and things like that before. But um, this could really be a book that was that's useful for people and also useful because for me to write my bio, uh, autobiography, I know people are like, you were way too young and I probably was. But at the same time, um, examining yourself from an objective point of view and be able to convey it to other people, your journey to other people in a way that you're trying to give them a lesson is like the most valuable thing that I have ever done because it allowed me to step outside myself and serve myself in a way that I, for flexible, was doing all the time, but I was treating my own journey like a teaching tool. And it made me realize a lot of things about who I am and made me seek a lot of help along the way that I would never have had I not written that book. So I would just, as a friend, urge you to... What? You truly, you truly inspire. I mean, like I've been thinking about a friend of mine, I was telling him about something else. It's like, you need to, you need to write about, or you need to write a book about how you've survived everything. I'm like, I've gone on the other side of that. Apparently not everyone has. And if they have, what do you do? What do you do? Where do you, how do you find someone who's willing to uh, honestly and with a sense of humor, just be like, yeah, and, that, and then that happened. Ah. Exactly. No, you have amazing stories in your life. You've, you've, you've overcome so many things. You've gone through so many things. And I think in this state of being uncensoredly Kim, this, this would be like the, a really, I think it would be great for you, but also great for the world to be able to see, uh, um, read it. So it would be much horse poop. Um, Cute little kitty asks, obviously having a label has helped you understand yourself a lot. Do you think, are you worried or do you think being labeled neurodivergent might change how others perceive you um, or how you perceive yourself? So I think that's interesting, like, especially if, if you choose to get, pursue acting a little more seriously or any, anything going to come like convention, like, is, do you feel like people are going to see you differently? And are you worried well, about that or not really? This is, this is one of the conversations we had to have and I've had with other members of the autistic community uh, when we were looking at my daughter um, in terms of the word label. Here's the thing. Yeah. I am labeled no matter what. I'm labeled too much. I'm labeled weird. I'm labeled wrong. I'm labeled dramatic. I'm labeled a problem. I'm labeled obtuse. I'm labeled, I am labeled no matter what. When I choose the label. I put myself back in power. Is that going to change how people see me? I hope so. Because it's a label that I chose. As opposed to a label that they chose for me. That they. That is comfortable for them. To excuse my behavior. And somehow make how I present myself. Comfortable to them. Yeah. Well, that's not my job. It's not my job to take care of how they see me. Yep. Um, so am I worried? No, I don't think anybody really cares. I, um, I mean, uh, I just think, I think that it's going to be a revelation. I mean, did you see my face during this podcast? I literally did. I had, you said, like I said, you said late age diagnosis of autism. I'm like, oh, oh, it's interesting. I haven't really talked about her, about her, her kiddo. And 
suddenly you come out and my mouth, I literally had to close my jaw because I noticed it was just hanging open like I could catch some flies in it. And so I, I, I really, I really think it's something that even people reading chat right now, sorry, podcast people, you're not here, but I'm um, saying that they can't get a diagnosis or they've been, they had relatives diagnosed later in life. And this is cer certainly something that you don't really hear about. It's very, especially for um, people who present typically, who my support needs are not something that are always recognized. Mm -hmm. um, I do find, and they're more obvious now that I'm no longer feeling compelled to mask. Yeah. But it's still things that I've learned to, to turn into a joke or to twist or to, you know, be concerned with the other person's needs. Yeah. Um, but people who present in a typical way often are not diagnosed because the diagnosis comes, we attach, we attach dysfunction to the mm -hmm. notion of disability. So if someone's functioning, clearly they must not be disabled. I'm like, I'm just functioning in your eyes. Yeah. I'm falling apart in my experience. Wow. And so um, I, I hear you about the acting. You're, you're feeling like it's not going to go further with you, but I want to just encourage, I know, I just want to encourage you because you are so magical and so talented. Yes, and I anywhere. understand there's- I mean, somebody calls me. I'm yeah. not going to turn them down. But exactly. <laughs> are you going to be doing, I, I asked this for uh, Sam and Jim, um, are you going to be doing any conventions? Because uh, people want to meet you. And also I just would love you to shout out to the audience. Um, if anybody would uh, be able to go and see you in person, are you doing uh, Supernatural Cons, uh, non-Supernatural Cons? Kansas City with <gasps> Sam. Everybody's doing Kansas City. Gosh, darn it. No, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 mayhem um kansas city and then shreveport the weekend after that nice i think called geeked con my mm -hmm. apologies if i'm getting those confused uh my names and my locations but i'm going to shreveport after that and then once creation comes back again i'm scheduled to do some creation events yes but and also, they're just coming back i think they're coming back in i'm supposed to do new orleans i think yeah i think that that's supposed to be their first one Mm -hmm. um, and even those, I'm kind of like, uh, -huh, might be hurricanes. Uh, -huh, might not get there. I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of, uh, do you just the whole journey of going to a convention has somebody like, oh, getting in the car, going to the airport, going through security, being picked up by a stranger. Like all of them has so many like components that I haven't been exposed to. I'm just thinking it through. I'm getting anxious. Like is there, now that you are more self-aware um, of the way that you, some of, the, what, some of the reasons why you react to some things and also what certain things elicit in you and reasons for it, um, do you think you'll approach conventions in a different way? Are you looking forward to them? Are you dreading them? Like what? Um, I, I'm a little dreading them. I'm a little looking forward to them. I think I will be less I think I'll be gentler with myself. I will step away when I need to step away. I have a hard time maintaining boundaries because like I said, one of the things, like there's this perception of autism that we are not empathetic. And that has not been my experience at all. If anything, we don't know how to not have another person's feeling. Like my experience when I'm on stage and someone asks me a question and becomes emotional is that, 90% of, well, 85% of me is feeling that I am consumed with their feelings. And the other 15% of me is going, am I making the right face? Are you making a face that's insulting? Make sure you're making the right face. Is this your interested face? Should you be looking in the person's eyes right now? Okay, now look away because now you're making it weird, Kim. You're making it super weird. And there's times when I'm like, yep, I'm making it weird. But everybody says, oh, you're making me cry. Or you're, wow. de but because of conventions, there are moments where just I can't put the mask on and mm -hmm. just what's in my heart comes pouring out of my mouth. And every single time in the past, I've regretted it. Every single time I've been ashamed, no matter how many people clap, no matter how many people say they were moved by it, I feel like I did the equivalent of taking my clothes off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I know what it is. 
And I'm just going to be like, okay, sweetie, you need to go sit down and have a candy bar now. Stop <laughs> feeling like you have to hug everyone that needs you. Yeah. Well, you there's a, there's not enough of you. I mean, like for me, being at home, I mean, I, I never appreciated, I don't know, there's a book. I, I, I would... I would venture to say you, before all of this, you would have, you would have said that you were an extroverted person. I would venture to say that, right? And so I, in separating myself, I, I realize now like what an introverted person I am. Because honestly, I would rather, yeah, oh, so this is something that you, so you would have said you're an extrovert and now you realize that that thing that you the thought was fueling you is draining you. The introverted realization came before the autism realization, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Was that during COVID or before COVID? Before COVID. It was before COVID. I retook the Briggs-Myers test because I was like, this is just not fitting me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I realized, and one of the things I did was, oh, a lot of my extroversion was actually, now I realize, masking. It was an attempt to control an environment Mm -hmm. that felt frightening because I didn't understand the social constructs of it. Yeah. That's really interesting. So now, cause you, when you, when you have this mythology about yourself, um, you, you kind of almost fulfill it in a, in a way. That's why when I read parent, there are a couple of parenting places. I love Janet Lansbury and Rye method and all that stuff. And really being careful not to label a kid something, um, uh, because they start to fulfill it like a year ago, you know, my kid is mischievous and someone, uh, accidentally started saying, oh, you're being so mischievous. I see her playing into that because at a, we're, we're so vulnerable. And when people, someone else says, oh, that's the way you are, we could see ourselves sort of becoming that, but we don't even know if that's us. And so maybe some of your big expressions, big emotions, people are mistaking them from for extroversion and you're going to be mistaking them for extroversion as well. It's not even the case, right? Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> Labels help me slot things into perspective sometimes, right? Like I, but the question is, do I choose the label for myself? Do I hear something and I go, oh, that looks like something I want to put in my mouth so that it becomes a part of me and I enjoy that? Or is someone putting this on me and now I feel the need to conform to it? So, um, so the so the extroversion was definitely security for me. Uh, what was your what was your Myers Briggs? Somebody is asking. I'm asking. INFP. Too. INFP. I think yeah. that's me too. I think I'm INFP. That's Inverted, like the most one of the rarest, right? It's the rarest feeling. one. Ugh, I don't know. INFP. I, rarest. Introverted, yeah. intuitive, feeling, and perceptive. Okay, rarest Myers Briggs is. INFJ, that's the one I am. INFP. So so I'm just judgmental whereas you are perceptive. <laughs> INF ISFJ. INFJ. INF. I mean, they, they say it's not necessarily scientific, but I feel like it's a pretty comprehensive. INFP is the only way to be. Okay, we got a lot of fans in chat. <laughs> well, listen. Um, I, I need to let you go cause it's nine o'clock and I respect people enough to let them go when I say they're going to, but I could talk to you for hours about this. Yeah. Like, honestly, I'm so fascinated. And I'm so happy for you in that this has allowed you some freedom to be who you are. Cause that for me is the number one thing in life that everyone, if you are living a life where you're not able to be yourself, then you're not living your life. And so I'm so happy for you. And I, I know that the acting world is very fickle. And, but just know that you are immensely talented, immensely incredible at what you do. And I have faith that opportunities will, as the world opens up, opportunities will too. And all the things you've learned being a camp counselor and teaching kids, like it's going to make you better at your, at your craft. And that's why I always look at everything because the wonderful thing about acting is we roll everything who we are up into it. And so the more we can progress in life, the more we have to offer with our acting, right? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And in the meantime, I will pick because you are so talented with your words and I'm so grateful for what you have been contributing as a writer to this world. Um, I will in, in all of our copious free time at some point, pick your brain 
Yes, uh, I want to help you on this journey because you have so much. I, I feel like yes, you have a, not only a story but just stories to offer. And I would, I am, I want, I want to be a service to you as a friend. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you so much. I love you so much. Uh, thank you. And where can, oh, everyone follow Kim, Kim Rhodes on the social medias as it's Kim Rhodes, just your name under, you uh, see? It's, what am I? No, I'm Kim Rhodes for. Oh, wait, she's not just Kim Rhodes. Okay. This is good. Where am I? I'm Kim Rhodes, the number four and real R-E-A-L because I was copying oh, Matt Cohen. Kim Rhodes for um, real. Okay. Kim Rhodes for real and yes and that's that's twitter and tiktok i'm oh, mildly yes. amusing you do TikToks TikTok. all the time they are brilliant follow I have a lot him on TikTok. tiktok i don't really get on there very often but i'm like what is she doing i'm like whoa she's setting the bar way too high right now <laughs> who am i on instagram i think it's reels with an s on it on instagram okay kim rhodes kim rhodes for reels on instagram if there was a somebody that no that's no, it's for real there too, I guess. Okay. She it. has a unified brand, you guys. Kim Rhodes for real. So I everyone have a follow her brand. Oh, a unified and meet her in person if you can. And um, you're wonderful. All right. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.